notify the members for a quorum call. Members, please take your seats. Madam Clerk, have all the required notices been given in accordance with the Open Public Meeting Act? Yes, they have, Mr. Speaker. Notice of the calendar of this uh, session of the General Assembly having been sent to the members of the House, the Secretary of State, and the State House Press and posted in accordance with the Open Public Meeting Act. I declare the House to be in session. Madam Clerk, please open the machine for a quorum call. <phone rings> Madam Clerk, please close the machine and take a tally. Mr. Speaker, you have 56 members present. You have a quorum. Resolution on the clerk's desk. Motion by Majority Leader Greenwald that the Assembly adopt Senate concurrent resolution calling for joint legislative session to receive the state of the state message from the governor. Majority Leader Greenwald. Mr. Speaker, I move the resolution. Majority Leader Greenwald moves the resolution. Second by Speaker Pro Temp Wemberly. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. I recognize the Senate Majority Leader from Essex County representing the 29th District, Senator Teresa Louis Ruiz. I Senator move that this joint session of the 220th Legislature does now come to order. I recognize Major Assembly Majority Leader from Camden County representing the 6th Legislative District, Louis Greenwald, Assemblyman Greenwald. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. I'm advised by the Secretary of the Senate and the Clerk of the General Assembly that a quorum is present for this joint session. Please rise for the invocation to be delivered by Rabbi Mayor Rottenberg of, of Gossam, Grand Rabbi of Linden. Uvini Shabashumayim, dear Father in heaven, we pray to you that you bless the governor, the first lady, the Senate president, the speaker, and all members of the legislature with the wisdom and strength to be able to continue to lead this state with fairness and justice. This country was established on the principles of freedom and liberty. We pray to you. Our Father in heaven, that these governing powers continue to enable those freedoms and liberties to prosper, allowing us to continue to practice our faiths and beliefs as we have done since this founding of the nation, as is evident on the currency of our country, which is inscribed with the words, in God we trust, may his name be blessed at a time when biased incidents are rising at alarming rates, we pray to you, Father in heaven, to protect our faith-based institutions and all citizens of this great state of New Jersey. As in verse in Psalms states, Im Hashem lo yishmar ir shav shukat shoymair. If God, may his name be blessed, does not watch over the city, Worthless is the watchman. To that, let us all say amen. Thank you, Rabbi uh, Rottenberg. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Minority Leader John DeMeo, representing the 23rd District. Leader. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Minority Leader. I recognize the President of the New Jersey Senate from Union County, representing the 22nd District, Senator Pres Senate President Nicholas Scatari. Mr. Speaker, I wish to inform the joint session of the 220th Legislature that the governor has arrived. My colleagues, honored guests, it is my honor and pleasure to present the governor of the state of New Jersey, the Honorable Phil Murphy.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It is good to be back. You know, maybe one of these years I might even get an office of this building. What up? Let's get this thing going. Lieutenant Governor Oliver, Senate President Scuteri, <laughs> Assembly Speaker Coughlin, Majority Leaders Ruiz and Green Greenwald. Minority leaders, Oroho and DeMeo, members of the 220th legislature, and especially the Rock and Bipartisan Escort Committee who led me into this chamber. Chief Justice Rabner, Associate Justices Patterson, Pierre-Louis, Fischali, and Wayne Raptor, Judge Sabatino, and Judge Grant. Members of the cabinet, senior staff, former governors, DeFrancesco, McGreevy, and Cody. And by the way, guys, I sure miss looking down there and not seeing Jim Florio with us. God bless Jim and Lucinda. <clears throat> First Lady Tammy Murphy and our sons Charlie. Charlie, that applause was for you. For our sons Charlie and Sam, great to have you guys with us. Distinguished faith leaders, honored veterans, first responders, leaders in organized labor, special guests, friends, and my fellow New Jerseyans. The last time we were together here was just days after Russia's malicious invasion of Ukraine. For more than 10 plus months, the bravery and strength of the people of Ukraine in fighting back against Russia's barbaric aggression has been nothing short of inspiring. 
I'm incredibly honored that we are once again joined by His Eminence, Metropolitan Anthony. God bless you and His Eminence. Amen. And His Eminence to his right, Archbishop Daniel, representing the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the United States of America, which, by the way, is headquartered in Somerset right here in New Jersey. With us as well to their right is a dear friend, Ukrainian Consul General Alexei Golubov. Alexei, it's an honor to have you with us. And you did not come alone. Thanks to the organization Kind Deeds with you today and with us scattered in this chamber are four members of the Ukrainian Defense Forces who were wounded in battle and have been receiving treatment in the United States. Gentlemen, it is an incredible honor to have you with us. To each, to each of you gentlemen, I restate that New Jersey proudly stands with the freedom-loving people of Ukraine in this moment of crisis, and we will do so for however long it takes. May God be with the free people of Ukraine and in honor and memory of the Ukrainians lost over the past almost year, both the brave soldiers and the innocent civilians, I ask that we observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Amen. Ten days ago, a new year dawned upon New Jersey. With the close of 2022, we ended our fifth year of partnership to make New Jersey the stronger and fairer state we know it must be to support our future ambitions. And as we start 2023 and embark on year six of our journey together, the state of our state is just that. We are stronger and we are fairer. We are moving confidently in the right direction, forward. Put simply, we are building the next New Jersey. A New Jersey ready to lead the way for our nation. A New Jersey with more opportunities, with more safety and more justice, with more freedoms protected, with greater affordability for more families, and with businesses and industries and jobs and careers that did not exist in our state a, sh a few short years ago. New Jersey is truly becoming the state of opportunity. We, we are shaping this next New Jersey in the service of growing and securing the middle class. As you've heard me say from day one, and this will not change on my last day as your governor, it is my mission and I think ours to make this state work from the middle out and the bottom up. I know where I came from, and that is why I always know who I work for. Like so many New Jerseyans, I am guided by family, fairness, and faith in the future. Those are the values I learned growing up. In our family, my parents worked hard, yet living paycheck to paycheck was too often our reality. They instilled in their four children, my late brother, my sisters, and me, the values of education, hard work, and faith. Now, the saving grace back then was that if you worked hard, you would get ahead and you would do better than your parents. And each of us did. That is our story. But 
Today, that notion of the American dream is harder to achieve for too many people. And that is why I am dedicated to creating pathways to opportunity. One of those pathways, by the way, just got wider. 10 days ago, the minimum wage increased to $14.13 an hour. And that, that is an increase that will help more than 400,000 New Jerseyans better provide for themselves and for their families. They are better off because we worked together to strengthen the road to the middle class. And I thank you. Anyone who is willing to work hard should be able to do better than those who came before them. Everyone deserves a fair shot. And at the same time, everyone must do their fair share. Reasonable, responsible government is back and paying dividends for New Jersey's families. We are rebuilding the American dream right here, more expansive and inclusive than ever before for all willing to put in the work. So today, every New Jersey family can be proud to live in a state which in so many ways is not just a model for our nation, but is leading our nation, leading in building a modern economy that doesn't just create good jobs today, but has the staying power to keep creating good jobs well into our future. Leading by centering our economic future around our best in the nation public education system so every child in every community is given the skills they will need to compete and to win. Leading by leaning into the clean energy economy to not just power our future, but to fight back against climate change. Leading and prioritizing youth mental health through comprehensive means that don't just connect kids with resources, but which empowers parents and educators to identify negative signs and then provide positive support. Leading and maintaining and preserving every woman's right to personal reproductive freedom. And, and trusting those very women with the ability to make the most intimate of healthcare decisions for themselves. Leading and protecting our communities from senseless gun violence with carefully crafted laws that keep guns out of our most vulnerable places. Leading in recognizing the inherent value that every member of our proud LGBTQIA plus community brings to our state and ensuring <laughs> and ensuring that everyone is given the basic human dignity to live life on their terms. Leading as we are through the work of the Lieutenant Governor, the Rockin' Sheila Oliver, in living up to our obligation as, in her capacity as uh, Community Affairs Commissioner to ensure that every New Jersey family has access to a safe and affordable place to call home. leading as the First Lady is doing and taking on long-standing racial inequities in maternal and infant health, with New Jersey, by the way, being one of only four states to improve in the most recent March of Dimes report card. Leading by living up to our obligation to make the word justice ring true in every community and to not just undo the injustices of the past, but to fix what was broken. How? By advancing environmental justice, by undoing the harm that the war on drugs did to our communities, by protecting, <laughs> by protecting our sacred voting rights, by standing strong against the ever-present and sadly rising tide of hate and intolerance, and by, and 
and by rejecting the politics of fear and grievance in favor of a new politics of hope and commonality. Now, surely fostering a stronger, fairer, responsible, more affordable, and growing New Jersey is what each and every one of us here were elected to do. And regardless of whether our names are followed by a letter D or a letter R, this is work to which we are all committed. Let's never forget that in the grand rankings of things, we are partisans fourth, elected officials third, New Jersey in second, and Americans first and foremost. As some of you may know, I have the great honor this year of serving as the chairman of the National Governors Association and sitting by my side as vice chairman is Governor Spencer Cox, Republican of Utah. There are, let me say it up front, there are fewer states in America that are more different than New Jersey and Utah. <laughs> Yet over the past six months, Spencer and I have come to respect each other, not just as colleagues, but even more so as close friends. And I know the same can be said for the First Lady and Utah's First Lady, Abby Cox. As Spencer said in his 2021 State of the State address, and I quote him, there must be no room for contempt or hate. We are friends. We must always be friends. Amen. This is, um, this is what we need more of in our politics, certainly at the national level, but right here at home as well. We must always be an example, not just to our constituents today, but I think importantly to those who will sit or stand in our positions tomorrow. People here are sharp, but rightfully skeptical. It's a Jersey thing. So let's never insult their intelligence. Let's always be honest and straightforward with them. They don't wanna see Washington style dysfunction and chaos and neither do we. They sent us here to make life in New Jersey better and we're doing that. And in 2023, we're gonna keep doing that. Now, while we celebrate the tremendous advances we've made, we remain cognizant that there are also seemingly intractable challenges at which we must continue to chip away. Affordability, for example, together, we created the Anchor Property Tax Relief Program, a historic $2 billion investment in direct property tax relief. This is money literally that's going right back into the pockets of roughly 2 million New Jersey middle class and working homeowners, seniors, and tenants, households in which, by the way, well more than half of our residents live. For more than a million homeowners, Anchor's direct relief will effectively undo years of property tax increases, even up to a decade's worth. Let me frame it this way. A middle-class family that's making our state's average household income, and that's just under $125,000, and that same family is paying our statewide average of $9,300 of property taxes. That family is going to receive $1,500 in direct relief, effectively dropping their property taxes to a level not seen since 2011. And then on top of that, for nearly 1 million renters, Anchor's tenant relief will cushion rent hikes. And by the way, with us here today is one of the millions of New Jerseyans who stands to benefit. Josimara Espindola Conti, I think you own your home in Robbinsville, right? Stand up and take a bow. There you go. So, Josimara has applied for her anchor relief, and I ask you to join me in making sure every other eligible family does as well. 
And today, working with the Senate President and the Speaker and Treasurer Liz Moyo, I'm proud to give them an extra month to do so. So folks, <laughs> folks, go to anchor.nj.gov. That's anchor.nj.gov and apply for your relief by February 28th. We continued to increase our investment in our public schools to take further pressure off of property taxpayers. A total increase, by the way, of more than $2 billion, with a B, dollars since our administration took office. And every penny of that is property tax relief. We enacted, again, together, a state-level child tax credit on top of more than a dozen other tax cuts for our middle class and working families, seniors, and veterans. We gave parents a sales tax holiday on the back-to-school items their kids needed to get a strong start this past September. We gave countless New Jerseyans a break by making Island Beach State Park and all state parks free, and also by waiving numerous licensing fees. And we started a streak of three consecutive credit upgrades because the rating agencies trusted our leadership. These... By the way, this is not abstract, folks. These new ratings mean money saved literally for every single New Jersey taxpayer. So in seven weeks, I'll be back here to unveil my proposal for the upcoming fiscal 2024 budget. And making New Jersey more affordable for our families and seniors will again be central in the plan that I present to you. But I remain incredibly proud of the work we have done again together in this current budget to make our state more affordable. And I remain grateful for the partnership of the Senate President and Speaker and our budget chairs, Senator Paul Sarlo, Sarlo and uh, Assemblywoman Ileana Pintor Morin. There you are, Ileana. Uh, well done, everybody. And I thank the leadership of our treasurer, Liz Moyo, a former member of your ranks. And as we continue our work to keep our families secure in their homes, we will continue to our work to make them feel safer in their communities. I noted our ongoing efforts to end the epidemic of gun violence that infects too many of our communities, and not just around our state, by the way, but across the country. Because of New Jersey's strong gun safety laws, in 2022, we saw shootings go down 26% and gun homicides go down 17%. But, but many of our communities are also living amidst another persistent wave of car thefts. Over the past year, our administration has focused clearly on this problem. We grew the state police's auto theft task force to give it greater ability to investigate and disrupt car theft rings, including adding new detectives and prosecutors. Police pursuit policies were revised to explicitly permit the pursuit of stolen vehicles. And then we marked $10 million in federal American Rescue Plan funds to purchase and install automated license plate recognition technologies for local police to better track and trace not just the stolen vehicles, but importantly, those being used to shuttle would-be car thieves into targeted neighborhoods. These steps, thank God, are already helping to bring down the numbers of car thefts. From September through December, car thefts were down 13% from the same four months in the previous year. And together, <laughs> and together we're going to continue driving these numbers down because we all know there is more work we can and must do. In fact, three months ago, I stood alongside legislative leaders from both houses to unveil a package to further tighten our laws against car theft. So I ask you today uh, with humility to make passing these measures a top priority. And if you send these bills to my desk, I will enthusiastically sign them. And as we take on crime, we also work for justice. 
Last year, I proudly signed into law a comprehensive police licensing framework, ensuring that law enforcement officers, and we've got a good one with us today, like Franklin Township Police Department Director of Public Safety, Quivella Mayweather. Quivella, please stand up and take a bow. Bless you. Thank you. Stay safe, please. So this, we stood together and put in place something that both recognized law enforcement officers as the highly trained and skilled professionals that they are, and at the same time, that they're held to high and uniform standards. And we saw the continued expansion of our transformative Arrive Together program, which pairs law enforcement officers with mental health screeners to respond to individuals experiencing a behavioral health crisis. We must continue our efforts to restore the faith and partnership between law enforcement on the one hand and the communities that they serve on the other. This partnership not only enhances the safety of our neighborhoods, but it protects our brave women and men in blue as well. There are so many people across law enforcement who deserve credit for all of this progress, but I cannot say enough about the leadership shown by Attorney General Matt Platkin and the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen, and let there be no doubt New Jersey is a safer state today. We're also going to continue to provide our families with the spaces where they can safely play and exercise and enjoy our state's unrivaled beauty. We announced the final purchase of the land that will become the Garden State Greenway. That's the conversion of nine miles of abandoned railroad track bed from the People's Republic of Montclair to Jersey City. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're all paying attention out there. Nine miles into a linear park that will rival any other of its kind, dwarfing Manhattan's High Line. To give you a sense of what that means, nine miles, Manhattan's High Line, 1.45 miles. Are you kidding me? Come to Jersey. I must give... <laughs> <clears throat> I must give a huge amount of credit to the team of the Department of Environmental Protection, headed by that guy, Commissioner Sean LaTourette. <laughs> Listen, in a state as small and dense as ours, this project exemplifies our belief that we can take previously underutilized or overlooked properties and turn them into points of civic pride to better our communities and our environment. And it exemplifies as well our commitment to environmental justice and to undoing the mistakes of the past, which pushed undue burdens on underserved communities so often, if not entirely, communities of color. And then there is one of our most tragic challenges, the fight against the opioid epidemic. <clears throat> From 2018 through 2021, Opioid deaths had remained relatively constant after huge increases throughout the previous five years. <clears throat> More than 3,000 New Jerseyans were lost to the opioid epidemic in three of those four years. <clears throat> but at last, we have a glimmer, and I say a glimmer at best of hope. The preliminary numbers for 2022 show 231 fewer drug-related deaths than in 2021. And that gives us our lowest statewide total since 2017. <clears throat> we, are, <clears throat> we are far from out of the woods. We are far from victory. One death is one death too many. And remember, these are our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters, our moms and dads, they are our friends.
They are our fellow New Jerseyans. But as we begin 2023, we are bringing new resources to this battle to save lives. Late last month, the Department of Human Services received approval to make New Jersey the first state in the nation to allow any pharmacy to provide anonymous and free access to naloxone to any individual at any time. Now, to be sure, naloxone alone is not going to end the opioid epidemic. Turning back this challenge requires constant vigilance from all of us and all levels of government and, frankly, all of us. But this nation-leading policy will ensure that a crucial and life-saving tool is put into the hands of more people, again, free and anonymously, so we could save more precious lives and allow individuals struggling, struggling with addiction to seek treatment. I thank especially the Commissioner of Human Services, Sarah Edelman, for her leadership in this groundbreaking initiative. Thank you, Sarah. And COVID remains a public health reality, even though the numbers of people in our hospitals are less than one third of what they were a year ago and half of what they were two years ago. Meanwhile, the flu and RSV are combining to further complicate things. These viruses are persistent adversaries, to be sure, but we have stronger weapons in our arsenal. First, we have the vaccines, and we encourage everyone to get their COVID booster and their flu shot. And second, we have another weapon, one that needs no introduction, Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli. Judy, thank you for your continued leadership. So, keeping families secure in their homes, safe in their communities, and able to get the treatment that they may need reinforces one of the most basic roles of government, a role outlined, by the way, by one of the first lines in our state's constitution, and I quote our constitution, government is instituted for the protection, security, and benefit of the people. But I would add equally as important to our charge is to ensure that our people have good jobs to support their families. And in this too, we have not only seen great successes in growing new economic, economic opportunities over the past five years, but we are setting New Jersey up for an even more prosperous future. Before our administration took office, our economic focus could be summed up as find a big company, any company, throw a big enough tax break at them to get them either to move to or to stay in New Jersey. That way of doing things came with limited successes. But I would add that the true downside of that way of doing things was that behind it, there was no strategy. <clears throat> no one ever stopped to ask what the New Jersey of 20 or 50 years down the line should look like. The only question that was ever asked was whether a deal could get done fast enough so it could be used in the next campaign commercial. So that is not how this administration has looked at job growth or economic development. Through the CEO of the Economic Development Authority, Tim Sullivan and his team, our focus Shamelessly fishing for applause for Tim. Through Tim and his team, our focus from day one has been to make New Jersey the place where the companies of tomorrow will come and plant their flags. We worked together again to overhaul our entire offerings of economic incentives to make them more responsive to our economic realities, more focused on our core economic strengths, and more persuasive to the key business sectors and startups we know have the ability to grow over time, including, by the way, 
a way cool first in the nation public private venture fund. When we first proposed our reform incentives program, I noted that we needed to be nimble and to work at the speed of business. So today in that spirit, I call for us to live up to this by coming together to make a necessary update. We have to recognize that in the new post-pandemic business environment, not every job created for a New Jerseyan is going to be housed in a physical office in New Jersey. For many New Jerseyans, working remotely is here to stay. So let's take this moment to focus on incenting jobs in New Jersey, wherever they are, regardless of whether they're in an office building in Newark or at a kitchen table in Cherry Hill. And at the same time, let's also make developing new green spaces and urban parks part of our incentive program too, because they can have just as much of a positive impact on the life of a community. And also at the same time, let's also continue the, the work of modernizing our infrastructure. We finally broke ground on the new Portal North Bridge, and I was tremendously honored to have President Biden by my side when we ceremonially did so. And numerous projects along NJ Transit's rail lines are moving forward. Projects that will improve the customer experience, improve reliability, and improve on-time performance. Additionally, and importantly, the project to build those long-awaited new rail tunnels under the Hudson River also move forward. And because of our partnership with New York, Amtrak, our congressional delegation, this White House, and the previous White House, we recently received a $292 million federal grant the first of what we anticipate to be many awards to get this project done. And here's what that will mean in simple terms. It'll mean fewer delays. And if by exempt for everybody, but if you, in specific, if you commute on the Raritan Valley line and have been waiting for your one seat ride into New York Penn, this will be your ticket. Now, she's not here because she's in Washington right now, fiercely representing New Jersey's in interests, but everything, infrastructure, goes through our terrific commissioner of the Department of Transportation, Diane gutierrez Scacchetti. <laughs> as much as these investments represent the future of our large-scale infrastructure, we know that it is local infrastructure that is the backbone of a community. And in many towns along our shore, that backbone is literally made of wood. So when I come before you next month, I will propose a new boardwalk fund that will partner with our shore towns and counties to make vital upgrades. Our boardwalks are more than just places for recreation and exercise. They're more than just the space that connects a parking area to the beach. They are literally wooden main streets in so many ways, and they define their communities and support their economies just as much as the sand and surf. So stay tuned. So for all of the excitement about our collective tomorrow, let's take stock for a moment of where we are today. First, our state has regained and grown new jobs for 31 consecutive months. <clears throat> Our unemployment rate stands at 3.4%. That's both lower than the national rate and the lowest, lowest it's been since right before the pandemic. <laughs> Moreover, in the third quarter of 2022, and that's the most recent quarter for which we have the data, New Jersey's GDP grew 3.9% above the level of the second quarter. That's the 10th biggest jump in the nation and the highest growth rate of any state in our entire Northeastern neighborhood. <laughs> what's more, what's more, it's more than a half a point growth of growth above the national average. And we outpaced 
many of the so-called business-friendly states, states that some claim we have to emulate, states including Georgia and Florida. So our clear record of success is greater than that of states that pay for huge tax breaks for the wealthiest and most powerful by taking away investments from things like public education and civic programs. In New Jersey, we are proving we can live our values, improve lives, and compete with anyone, anytime, any place. But even more than that, those states are not the leaders in new and emerging industries. We are. We are primed. <clears throat> we are primed to be a leader on the East Coast in offshore wind and a national leader in component manufacturing and logistics for the wind industry as a whole. In doing so, we are creating thousands of good, overwhelmingly union jobs up and down the entire state. all over the state, but especially in places like Gloucester and Salem counties, where the Paulsboro Manufacturing Facility and the New Jersey Wind Port are taking shape. We are growing an entirely new and broad-based adult use cannabis industry, an industry that is making room for women and minority small business owners, including a guy with us today, I'd love him to stand up and take a bow, Darren Chandler Jr. Darren, great job. Keep up the great work. We remain a leader in all aspects of online gaming and sports wagering. We are a leader in the financial services technology sector or FinTech, as evidenced by Fiserv's opening of its new office in Berkeley Heights in Union County, where roughly 3,000 jobs will be centered. John, you and I are together. We are taking full advantage of our location to be a global trading hub, as evidenced by the clothing retailer Uniqlo's decision to put their major logistics operations in Phillipsburg, in Warren County. And we are reclaiming our historic standing as the medicine chest to the world, welcoming tomorrow's leaders in the life sciences, while at the same time keeping companies that have proudly called New Jersey home right here. And one example is Roche, which is expanding its manufacturing footprint and creating new jobs in Branchburg in Somerset County. And then there is our burgeoning film and television production industry. The numbers for 2022 are still being tabulated, but the numbers for 2021 were recently finalized. In that year, film and television production poured more than a half a billion dollars into our state's economy. We were home, it's hard, these numbers are unfathomable. We were home to 725 productions, including 68 feature films and 132 television series. And these productions collectively created more than 5,500 jobs, again, almost entirely union jobs. It just over... <laughs> As my wife frequently reminds me, even Brad Pitt is a union member. In just four years since we joined together, all of us, with your help, to renew our suite of television and film production tax credits, we have supercharged productions in the Garden State, a more than six-fold increase in total investments. And every early indication is that 2022 was an even bigger year. Moreover, we are ready for the long term. Just before the holidays, we got one of the best possible presents with the announcement by Netflix that it will create a major production hub at the site of the former Fort Monmouth, a nearly $1 billion investment. that will create thousands of permanent and again, overwhelmingly union jobs. This, 
This investment underscores our emergence as a world-class location for television and film production. The dozen sound stages to be built, along with new housing and hospitality space, will revitalize not just Fort Monmouth, but will lift the small businesses all around it. More than anything, this investment by Netflix makes it clear to all, New Jersey is ready for our close-up. And it proves, it proves that the moves that we have made together to build our production industry have been the right ones. And on top of Netflix, Lionsgate Studio in Newark South Ward is moving closer to its own production, another huge feather in our state's cap. Listen, the motion picture industry was born in New Jersey. Fort Lee was Hollywood before there ever was a Hollywood. But like so much else, what past generations and prior politicians let get away from New Jersey, we're bringing back together. And because of the commitment of the Economic Development Authority and the New Jersey Film and Television Commission, and each of you, we are gonna make sure we don't lose that again. But while we are so proud of these major companies investing in our state, and we are, we know that our economy hinges even more so on the health and vitality of our small businesses in downtowns. A movie set in one of our great and historic downtowns is a great big deal, it's a great thing. But what's even better is knowing when your main street is gonna be just as active and just as lit up once the cameras are gone. <clears throat> our downtowns, I don't have to tell you, took a beating during the pandemic. And we have committed ourselves to bringing them fully back. We have helped our downtowns and small businesses make it through some very dark times and into the recovery, which is still ongoing. We've put more than a billion dollars of support out there. And together, and again, I thank you in the budget that we passed, we maintained our $50 million investment in the Main Street Recovery Program. And the holiday season saw our downtowns bustling again as they should be. <clears throat> but Main Street isn't just a place to shop. It's a place to gather. And I'm greatly aware that some of, if not the hardest hit businesses from the pandemic were our restaurants. And few were harder hit than the small neighborhood establishments, many, if not most, family owned, that couldn't get a liquor license that is so critical to maintaining a healthy profit margin. <clears throat> There's no other way to put it. Our liquor licensing regime is antiquated and confusing. We rely on a foundation of rules written in the days immediately after prohibition to govern a 21st century economy. That makes no sense. It makes no sense to restaurateurs like Aaron Ryan. Aaron, stand up and take a bow. <clears throat> Aaron, Aaron is the chef and owner, along with his wife, Nadine, of Milburn's Common Lot. By the way, Aaron has agreed to cook for all of us after my speech. <clears throat> Where a liquor license can ensure the stability of his establishment. Aaron, thanks for being with us today. And so I ask you all for your partnership in rewriting our liquor license laws to make them not just modern, but fair. The old rules have purposely created market scarcity and driven up costs to the point where a liquor license can draw seven figures. For many small independent restaurateurs, folks like Aaron and many others like him in other communities, and especially those in black and brown communities where access to capital has historically been limited, that is just way too high a price to pay. Expanding the number of available liquor licenses will not only help keep our favorite local restaurants healthy, it will also keep our economy healthy. This won't be easy, folks, but it's worth it. We project that overhauling our liquor license regime will create upwards of 10,000 jobs annually, and over the next 10 years, generate up to $10 billion in new economic activity and $1 billion in new state and local revenues. And here's how we can do it. 
Right now, the number of liquor licenses allowed to be issued by any local government is one for every 3,000 residents. I propose that over the next few years, we gradually relax this requirement and expand the number of available licenses until the restriction is eliminated in its entirety and the market can then work freely. Meanwhile, we can maintain the local control that is so critical in making sure our downtowns retain the character that makes them so special. Now, I fully recognize that some restaurants have made significant upfront investments to obtain their current licenses, and we must be fair to them. And I propose a targeted tax credit to support them as the supply of licenses grows. I further ask you to join me in removing outdating licensing and operating restrictions on our craft breweries, distilleries, and wineries, which are seeing nothing short of a true renaissance. And they, by the way, are represented here today by Abby Gailey of Medford's Low Lower Forge Brewery. Abby, stand up and take a bow. <clears throat> Medford, as I think some other folks up there will agree, is in the house tonight. Uh, great to have you with us, Abby. People from all across the Northeast and indeed from across the country are coming to taste what is being poured from our bottles, taps, and barrels up and down New Jersey. They're coming to enjoy one of the best and most diverse restaurant scenes of any American state. It is absolutely imperative that we keep this renaissance going. For Aaron and Abby and so many others, there's simply no reason for us to push this off any longer. And as an aside, one of the easiest decisions Tammy and I ever made was to serve only New Jersey made beers and wines to our guest at Drumthwacket. And we're adding, by the way, not that I would care, New Jersey made spirits to this list by the end of the month. <clears throat> there goes the Jameson. We do this because we want to share our Jersey pride with everyone who enters the people's house. And we know this Jersey pride is bubbling up once again all throughout our state. Now, we've always had swagger. In past times, it was our line of defense against any number of slights and jokes. But not anymore. It is okay to admit it. It is cool to be from New Jersey again. <laughs> <clears throat> it's cool because we are once again leading in all the right things, protecting the basic rights and honoring the human dignity of every New Jerseyan, in attracting the high growth industries of tomorrow, in creating opportunity for every individual in every community for a world class education and a good paying family supporting job. And because of 2026, we get to host the World Cup. <laughs> Many of us were glued to our screens throughout late November and into December cheering on the US men's national team. And as in just about everything else, New Jersey played a huge part in our country's run. Team USA's midfield attack was in part fueled by Brendan Aronson of Medford, again, in Burlington County. And our national team's goalkeeper is the pride of Park Ridge in Bergen County, Matt Turner. Now, Brendan and Matt are currently across the pond playing for their respective English premier teams, Leeds United and the Arsenal Gunners. But I'm incredibly honored that in the balcony with us today are Brendan's parents, Rusty and Janelle, and Matt's mom and dad, Matt's mom and dad Cindy and Stu. Can you all stand up and take a bow? So cool. On behalf of your New Jersey 
family folks. Thank you for all you and your sons are doing to further deepen our Jersey pride. And in four years, New Jersey will welcome the world to games at MetLife Stadium. And there is a real shot that we will host the final match right here in New Jersey and see the World Cup trophy hoisted on the pitch in East Rutherford, Bergen County, New Jersey. <laughs> but even more, through Brendan and Matt and God willing other Jersey lads in four years, whether coaches or players or staff, our World Cup experience will have a decidedly New Jersey flavor. And I cannot wait to see them playing on American soil and with a little bit of luck on Jersey soil. Through our burgeoning Jersey pride and through our continued hard work, we know our shared future is bright. It is bright because we are building the next New Jersey. Everything we do is guided by our belief that tomorrow can be better than today for the state that we all love. As Nelson Mandela said, and I quote him, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. He went on, it always seems impossible until it's done. Amen. Focusing on hope is not simply an act of optimism. It is an unshakable belief in this state and in everyone who calls New Jersey home. Some governors boast that their state is where woke goes to die. I'm not even sure I know what that means, but I could tell you very confidently, New Jersey is where opportunity lives, where education is valued, where justice is embraced, where compassion is the norm, and where the American dream is alive and well. Thank you. We have done so much to make New Jersey the best state in the nation to live, to work, and raise a family, but we can be even better. We have residents who still need us to extend a hand in compassion and partnership. We have challenges to continue to rise up to, and we have new brass rings at which to reach. I don't have to tell you all, governing is not easy. It is hard work. But together, we have taken on everything that's come our way. We've taken on every challenge with that same swagger we're known for as New Jerseyans. And now is no time to stop and admire the view, especially when a brighter horizon remains forever ahead. Thank you all so very much. May God bless you and your families and may God forever bless the great state of New Jersey, and the United States of America. God bless you.